Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Vali Nasser, the Dean of Johns Hopkins University School of Advanced International Studies, and it is my pleasure to welcome everyone to the China Exit interview. We are very proud today uh, to do this event uh, in co collaboration with the Paulson Institute, uh, the Institute's Think and Do approach in strengthening U.S.-China relations through promoting economic growth and environmental preservation is one that resonates deeply with the SAIS community. Uh, like the Paulson Institute, SAIS is also committed to promoting a better understanding of China and sustainable and harmonious relations between China and the world. Uh, since 1986, SAIS has had a campus in Nanjing, China, in partnership with Nanjing University, and we're very pleased that uh, this coming June we will be celebrating the 30th anniversary of this uh, unique partnership. It is a partnership that was the first of its kind. It formed the foundation of what is now an expansive and multidisciplinary focus on China in the science curriculum, in students' experience, and through the thought leadership and marquee events and scholarship of our faculty and uh, experts. It has had uh, a market uh, uh, influence on training a generation of uh, 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 non-Chinese experts on China and uh, Chinese experts on America. Today, SAIS is also uh, proud to be home to a joint degree program with Tsinghua University and also home to a leading program for the study of China in the United States here in Washington. Similarly, the Paulson Institute is also widely recognized for its innovative and influential thought leadership, which is reflected in the impressive lineup of China experts for today's discussion. I'm pleased to welcome Bill Bishop, a writer at Sonicism China Newsletter, uh, Gary Epstein, media editor at The Economist, Jeremy Goldcorn, founder and director of Danway, and Evan Osnos, staff writer at The New Yorker. I would like to especially thank Deborah Lair for her initiative and leadership in making this event possible. She's a longtime observer and commentator on China and both a senior fellow at the Paulson Institute and a member of the advisory board at SAIS and continues to be a trusted advisor to both institutions. So without further ado, I'm pleased to introduce Evan Feinbaum, Vice Chairman of the Paulson Institute. He will say a few remarks and then lead the discussion. Evan? All right. Well, thanks, Molly, and welcome, everybody. Uh, I'm Evan Feigenbaum, as Vali said. I'm vice chairman of the Paulson Institute at the University of Chicago. Um, and I see a lot of friends, old and new, in the audience. Those of you who know me know I'm kind of a Washington guy. I spent about 10 years here. And my background actually principally is on national security and foreign policy. But the Paulson Institute, by contrast, is a Chicago-based institution. And the focus is principally on economics and finance on the one hand, and uh, the environment and conservation on the other, sometimes, uh, but not always at the intersection of those two. Uh, now, since we're the new kid on the block, we're kind of a new think tank, if you could just indulge me for a minute, I'll just say, uh, just to follow up on what Vali said, we, we're a think tank, and uh, if you haven't seen some of our work, I encourage you to take a look at the website. Uh, we publish a, an array of work on macroeconomic issues in China, structural reform. But as Vali said, we're also, we like to say we're a do tank. And so we have colleagues that do an array of pilot projects and other initiatives, particularly in China, in areas like air quality, cleaning up the air, conservation. Uh, we do programs on cross-border investment and so on. So uh, this is a nice chance and we appreciate uh, our colleagues at SAIS giving us the chance to introduce the Institute uh, here in uh, Washington as well. Now, uh, to the program. I am delighted to have these guys on stage. I was just joking. I've never seen all of them. We're old friends and I've never seen all of them in a tie before. So <laughs> they clean up 
I gotta say, guys, you clean up incredibly well. I think you're the only one I've ever seen in a tie. Yeah. And it was in a Paulson Institute program that you put the tie on. I think it, until we're all indicted together, this is the only yeah, time. Exactly. It's yeah. like, <laughs> yeah. But I am, I'm delighted to be doing this first because. Uh, Unindicted co conspiracy. <laughs> uh, first, because we're all friends up here, but uh, second, because these are some of the sharpest and wisest observers I know on China. Now, we're calling the program the China exit interview, which I actually ripped off from Jeremy and his colleague Kaiser Guo, who have a, a podcast and had done exit interviews with uh, a few people, including one or two on this stage, mm -hmm. as they left China. But the concept was pretty straightforward, which is that we wanted to pull together a few very casually interesting people we knew who had spent about a decade each in China and had basically just left uh, and returned to the United States after spending a long time in China doing whatever it is they were doing, journalism, business, and so on. So in the case of three of these folks, uh, you're pretty much just returned, Bill, Jeremy, Gotti. Evan, you've been, you're fairly recently turned, a little bit longer, but we still think of you as a, as a Beijing fixture. Um, and the idea, the idea here also is to try to talk about China a little bit in a way that I think, as somebody who spent many years in Washington, we don't always get in Washington. I, I've found that the focus tends to be on geopolitics or on geoeconomics. We hear a lot about rocks and reefs and low tide elevations and currency valuation and so on, uh, all of which is tremendously important, including to the interests of the United States. Uh, but what I've asked uh, this panel to do tonight is to talk especially about China uh, itself, not just US-China or the kinds of issues that you hear in the US-China debate, to give a little bit of texture and some more complexity uh, to the way we think about this country that's in very rapid evolution toward something or other. And we can talk about what that is tonight. Now, just to set a scene for a sec, um, this is 2016. This is my, it's my 31st year involved with China. I first went there uh, to study Chinese in 1985. And while there have been lots of ups and downs and interesting moments over the years, I would say, you guys may argue with this, but I would say that to me this is one of, if not the most interesting moments that we've seen in a long time. Because to my mind, so many of the assumptions that people had about the place seem to be under question or are in play. Things are up for grabs in ways that they haven't been for a while and are evolving toward something new and different, whatever that might be. So to make that real for you, I mean, just think about the economy or politics or foreign policy. The economy, China's had this growth model that's been so successful for so many decades, premised on things like investment in fixed assets or export-led industries. Uh, but particularly since the crisis in 2008, uh, China's had to rethink a lot of the elements of that strategy. And economic reform, it's not, to my mind, an intellectual problem so much as a political problem. You look at the 12-5 year plan or you look at various uh, strategy documents, there is, broadly speaking, an understanding of where they need to transition to consumption, higher value added industry, and so on. But getting there is hard, and whether they'll get there is hard, and there are plenty of people that don't necessarily want to get there. Likewise, politics. Um, maybe you think I'm wrong, but I'd have to say that I think the current administration in China has taken many things that I thought were part of the rule book and kind of ripped up the rule book. The uh, Politburo standing committee member going to jail, something I would not have expected in the decades I've been involved with China. And so the old rules have been replaced with something new. Uh, and that newness includes a lot of uncertainty about what the new rules might be. And likewise on foreign policy, which I've spent a lot of my career working on, you know, this was a country that for many years we heard was, you know, very focused on integrating itself into international institutions, but now with, for instance, the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, it's actually taking the initiative to create new institutions. This is something, this is something very new. So it's a time of transition in China toward something. But for my part, I think, uh, while I find it interesting, I actually have a lot more uncertainty than I've had in a lot of the 30 years I've been looking at this place about where it's going and why and where it's going to end up. So that makes it interesting, but it also makes it fairly complex. Now, what I told the panel was that uh, I don't want this to be serial Q&A where I kind of throw questions and call on people. We're hoping this will be more of a discussion and interactive and I'm going to try and get folks going at it with each other a little bit. But I'm hoping that we can touch on a few big themes, things like uh, how resilient is the Chinese system, particularly the political system. 
Every time I turn on the television, I hear that, you know, that China's going to collapse by next Tuesday. Um, <laughs> you, know, you turn on Squawk Box, uh, the, the end of the world is nigh. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. But I, I, I want to talk a little bit about strengths and weaknesses of the system and where you see uh, resilience uh, and not resilience. We all know the Chinese system is brittle, but brittle to, to what end? How adaptive is it? Uh, second, how do people relate to this system? in their ordinary lives, whether it's you know, petty corruption at the day-to-day -day level, hospitals, municipal governments, uh, but also where do they see opportunity or annoyance in the system. Um, when you have 120,000 plus social protests a year, you got a lot of unhappy people. Um, uh, but if you pull that thread a little bit, what does that unhappiness mean? How do people relate to the system in a day-to-day -day way? Um, third, just to throw out a few more things that we can talk about. Um, what motivates people? You know, for so many years, and Evan, I mean, so much of your reporting from China was focused on individuals. Um, well, and his great book. And his great book. Thank you, Bill. National Thank Book you. Award winner. <laughs> your, your check is coming in the mail. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> Expect something in the high two. <laughs> um, you know, so for so many years we heard, you know, people wanted to get rich. To get rich was glorious. So to what, you know, people motivated by money? Is it nationalism? Is it family? Is it religion? What motivates people? How do people think about not just China's place in the world, but Chinese, the Chinese place in the world? And then last, and I think since this is an exit interview, uh, what was it like to be there for so long? And how did you see the place change? How hard was it to do what you did? And how did it change over the years that you were there? So I, I want this to be a discussion, but I, I do want to start with one kind of round robin where I do serially throw something at you. I'm wondering, let's just start with Bill and go down. If you could just say something about, you know, what, what turn did you take? How'd you end up there? Like, I took a left turn in eighth grade social studies and ended up doing China. <laughs> so what was, your le what was your left or right turn that you okay. ended up there? Well, and, actually, and, it's, it's, and one more thing, and more importantly, not just how'd you get there, but what did you assume or presume about China when you got there that with the benefit of hindsight, now that you spent all these years and you've left, you look back and you say, I can't believe I thought that about China. I was so wrong about that. What, what, How what much time do we have? Hold on a second. We're, we're doing another 10 minutes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, well, it, it's wonderful to be back. I'm actually a SICE grad. I did China studies as class of 95 um, under Professor Lampton's predecessor. Um, so it's, it's, it's nice to be back. Um, I actually first went to China in 1989. I was there for the spring. I was a student at, at Peking University when all the stuff happened. Um, and I had no idea what was going on. I had studied Chinese for three years, but I really didn't have any clue. And so I went back, finished college, went to Taiwan for a year, and then went back to, to, to Beijing for about a year and a half, thinking I would sort of figure out what was going on. Um, Twenty, what is it, seven years later, I still trying to figure it out. Um, but then uh, after SAIS, I went to California. I was in California for 10 years, and I moved to Beijing, uh, kind of the beginning, middle of 2005, to first do business, and then sort of, you know, how life kind of evolves. Um, and then we moved back here to DC uh, last August, so just not quite six months ago. Um, I think when I first went, I started Chinese because Japanese was hot and the line was at the door at my college, and Chinese <laughs> seemed like it might be easier. Um, and I think for a lot of people who are in China, you know, you, if you like the language, once you get into it, you really can't get away from it because it's such a, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a lifelong challenge to try and learn Chinese. Um, you know, while we were there, I think when we moved back, when I moved back in 2005, it was really the sense of, you know, I've been in California, I've been in San Francisco, I've been to the Silicon Valley, you know, bubble, bust, and sort of slow resurgence. It really felt like um, there was so much possibility in China, not just to make money, but there's so much, you know, China's a very dynamic place. It's, all, it's still very dynamic, but there was so much change coming, and it felt, in many ways, it was a very hopeful period. Um, and the Olympics were coming, and I think we were all there during the Olympics period, and, and it was sort of the sense of sort of this, this place is different, but it's heading in some, some good directions, not all good, but certainly some positive directions. And that, um, you know, maybe we should have paid more attention to the Olympics opening ceremony. Um, but I think, you know, eight years on, there are some strands out of that opening ceremony that we're kind of seeing now. And so over the last, um, really last two years I was there, um, and it really I think it, it, it corresponds with the, the rise of Xi Jinping, a lot of that sort of hopefulness um, from a sort of a, a more positive political change perspective has, has, 
is, is, is shifted or has, is dissipated. And it's not just the foreigners up here on the, on the stage. I think I see it with a lot of my, my, my Chinese friends. I mean, it's always, I'm, I'm very wary about sort of saying what Chinese people say because I had my small circle of friends in Beijing and that doesn't necessarily apply to the whole country. And I'm certainly not gonna pretend it does. But I think that um, what we're seeing now is that it, it corresponds with economic problems, it corresponds with the political changes, the corruption crackdown, which is supported by a lot of people until it means that their business suffers because they no longer get the sort of the trickle down effect from, from all the graft. So I think um, one of the, you know, there are several reasons we left and I'll spare you the litany, you know, they include the air and the kids and the education, et cetera. But the, the bigger reason for me was that there, for me, it really feels like there's a shift going on where under Xi Jinping, it, it's another one of those cycles in Chinese history where they're trying to de, there's, there's gotta be a good, uh, you probably know the right word, but sort of de-foreign, sort of push back on the foreign influences. And as a foreigner in Beijing, that increasingly became uncomfortable. And you saw, you know, we, we all saw, we were there in 2012, we saw what happened with the protests, uh, uh, the anti-Japanese protests over the nationalization of the islands in September of 2012. And as an American there, you know, I, I have little kids, you start thinking, okay, this could, the, 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 the atmosphere is being set up so that this could actually happen to Americans too pretty quickly if, if, if something went, went sideways. And so um, it just was a less of an interesting place. Maybe I'm older, but um, there's still dynamic. I miss the food, I miss my friends, I miss the energy. I mean, DC is obviously an interesting town, but it doesn't quite have the level of the sense of dynamism. And, um, but ultimately, you know, it, it, and, and for me, it, it really came down to, and, and Evan talks about in his book, this sort of ambition and possibilities where, feels like there are just fewer possibilities right now between the political, the re, sort of very re, sort of political regression as well as the economic problems. It's just, it's a very difficult time. To your question, and I'm almost done, to your question about sort of is the system, um, you know, is it gonna collapse? I mean, it could collapse since 2001, right? Every year, was, the collapse was coming. Um, I think that uh, actually um, what you're seeing is you were just heading towards a much harder authoritarianism where you look at what Xi Jinping done is, has done since he came to power and he clearly had support of many people at the top levels of the party, at least at the beginning, is he took control of security services. He taking, looks like he's taking control of the PLA. He, he has control over the sources of hard power in China. And so even though there are these social issues, even though there's economic issues, he controls, I think, a very much uh, empowered security service. Um, a very, and so it's a very, again, there's a lot of the ingredients for a very difficult few years in China. Yeah, so if you have, you were age, the book's called Age of Ambition. So if you have ambition without possibilities, that's a recipe for a lot of frustration. So is that how you see it as well, or you see? Well, it's uh, funny, actually, you know, while I was writing Age of Ambition, um, even before I was finished, I mean, it came out um, in uh, the summer of 2014, and by the time I was done, people said, well, maybe it needs a new title, you know, The Age of Unfulfilled Ambition. I was like, well, that's just not a very beautiful <laughs> title. Uh, uh, the Age of Expectations. But, I mean, this is, um, and I want to say just to, as a preface, you know, it's a treat to be with this group up here, and I'm, and I'm grateful uh, to Evan. I'm the secondary Evan up here, I should say, the backup Evan. If the primary Evan fails, you can rely on me as a backup Evan. Um, and Valley for having us in today. It's, it's, what's nice is, you know, our friendship as this group is sort of an artifact of a period in China when we were all there pursuing ideas, and that was really thrilling. And I think one of the things about China is that every generation that arrives does feel, and this it ties partly to the concept of ambition, they, everybody feels as if they have just splashed ashore and they are the first people to ever come upon this kind of magical mystery and strange and bewildering and maddening place. And that's the thing about China is that um, I think for a lot of people in this room, you didn't expect to be a China a China hand um, or get drawn into it. I mean, the, my story of how I got interested was I was studying in, in 1996, I was in college in the US and I started getting interested in, um, I started getting interested really in Tiananmen Square and what had happened in 89. And in order to understand how that all happened, you had to speak the language and I began to study the language and then followed the sort of Bill Bishop experience, which is you discover, wait a second, this is a code. This is like a secret code and none of my friends know it, and therefore uh, I want to know more of it. And, um, but I, I think what was interesting was I went over to China, um, I went over to China in 96, and I was, I mean, the big mistake in some sense was that I think I was shaped 
by the overhang of 1989 and, and, and also of the 1980s. I had studied very uh, intensively what had happened in Eastern Europe and also the evolution in Taiwan, the political evolution in Taiwan. And I think built into my assumptions was a sense that, well, this is probably what's, some yeah. version of this is gonna unfold in China. Um, and this was, you know, I, a lot of people had this sense. And a friend of a lot of us on the stage, I won't out him by name, but a friend of ours who was studying in Beijing in the mid 90s, um, was so convinced that the regime was going to end that he extended his study abroad by like a month and then another month because he would keep calling up Harvard and saying, you know, I, I, it's, it's just about to happen. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to miss it. This Gordon Chang? I, I'm not, yeah, I won't. Uh... <laughs> so there is this set. We've all kind of, in the same way I think that all of us arrive in China thinking that um, we're the first people to be intoxicated by it. I think on some level also we all imagine that we're there on the cusp of history and what we discover is that there are these layers of, of history that build on top of each other. And the one thing that I guess I take away from it being wrong about um, China's, the sort of inevitability of China's transformation in the 90s was the sense that it is adaptable in ways that we sometimes underestimate. And you can choose adaptable a little bit as like one of, is a word like ambition. You can read it as a pejorative or as a positive. And it either means that you're willing to give up your mistaken assumptions or it means that you're willing to renounce things that you care about. And in China's case, in the late 1970s, it realized, you know, economic, socialist economics aren't doing us any favors and they walked away from it. Um, and so China turns out to be much more adaptable than we expected. And I think it's one of the reasons why we're now confronting this period in which it, it sort of bedevils us today. Yeah. So Jeremy, the dead weight of unfulfilled expectations? Or are you... Uh, you mean Jeremy? Or, uh, Jeremy. <laughs> well, um, I mean, I should point out, I, I'm not, I haven't come back to America. No, I'm from South no. Africa. Um, so I'm a new immigrant. You yeah, picked a great America time to be an immigrant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> careful, careful. Um, and uh, I, I think I went to China to get as far away from home as possible, is the honest answer. Um, and I arrived in China not having studied anything about China. There were no Chinese or, or Asian studies courses at South African universities uh, when I was a student. So I arrived in 1995 with an English teaching job uh, and lived in a worker's dormitory on the outskirts of Beijing. Um, uh, in a dormitory with a bunch of migrant workers from Anhui and Henan, um, and a toilet that had 50 squat toilets with no walls between them. Uh, so I was constipated for a couple of weeks. Um, so that was my introduction to China. Um, so, I mean, in some ways, everything just kept on getting better, and I, I shouldn't have <laughs> any, any complaints. Managing expectations. <laughs> um, but, uh, so, I, I mean, I was really a complete naïf when I arrived. I, and I, I, f I felt at the time that I was like a baby. I, I didn't know what the food was. I couldn't use chopsticks. I couldn't read. I couldn't speak. Um, and it was all new. And I, I didn't really have any expectations. Uh, and I mean, the first thing that amazed me and that I'm still you know, very happy about was that Chinese people weren't inscrutable people without a sense of humor. And you know, arriving in Beijing, which is a place with a very uh, bawdy sense of humor where people like to swear and tell dirty jokes was just completely con confounded my expectations. Um, I, I, but I, I mean, I too, I think, um, felt uh, from the time I arrived, really, 1995, until I think 2009, that it was a place that, uh, you know, there were a lot of hopeful things, you know, n not just about making money, but lots of, of different things that were going on. And I also felt throughout that time that I kind of had a good sense of where China was going. I sort of felt like I know what next next year is going to be like. Mm -hmm. And then there was the Olympics, the global financial crisis, and then Xi Jinping. And now I kind of feel as though I don't know what the hell is going on there. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, I, I, sometimes I, I'm convinced by arguments saying China's going to collapse tomorrow. And sometimes I'm convinced by arguments saying, well, you know, it's not. It's got to go through this period because the economy has to rebalance. A lot of restructuring is going to have to take place. There's all this, uh, the benefits of the last 30 years, but that economic model doesn't work anymore and it's just going to be a tough time. So um, I certainly have, uh, I feel as of the last few years, I've had to sort of be humbled by the fact that, uh, you know, living there straight for 20 years, you know, I still really, you know, don't know what I'm talking about.
Uh, By the way, that would be the most honest book title about it. <laughs> <laughs> there, there, is the, there is the old joke about if you go to China for a month, you can write a book. If you go there for a year, you can write an article. And if you stay longer than five years, you can't even write a postcard. Um, I don't so, think Evan finds that funny, though. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Somebody else's joke. Right. I like it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I will, I'll await your book. <laughs> It'll be a good postcard, Evan. Um, so I, I, you know, I, I, that's what I sort of feel about looking at, at the way China is now. Uh, I mean, I'd just like to add one more thing, which is I come to this country a year ago as a new immigrant, and everybody's complaining about it, you know, <laughs> on the right and the left. They all say, oh, America's broken. And I'm like, it's so nice here, you know? <laughs> and, um, <laughs> One of the things that I have to compare, like to discuss problems in China, I just want to discuss a really micro problem, something on a really mm -hmm. you know, personal level, which is Beijing. And I, I have, if anybody does listen to the podcast, I have said this before, so forgive me if you've heard it. But um, I, I, before we left, we lived in a, quite a nice part of town in a fairly nice apartment building. Uh, all of my neighbors seemed to own Lamborghinis and Ferraris <laughs> and Bentleys. And uh, one day I open the front door, you know, I go out the front door of the apartment complex and there's this pavement, you know, sidewalk there, and there's a, a human um, poop on, uh, on the sidewalk, right in front of the door of this fancy apartment complex. And, you know, this is something that I think does give you a clue of how big the problems China still has to solve, you know, e even in the part of town where the people are buying Lamborghinis, somehow there's a human poop in front of my apartment building. <laughs> I don't think that happens that much you don't in think Tony that Park's just DC, personally it? directed at you? <laughs> <laughs> it may have been, so let me add that. Are you making an <laughs> addition? <laughs> yeah. By the way, I, I like what you By did there. You brought it full circle. <clears throat> you brought it back around. Back to poop. <laughs> and uh, I'd like to... Can you change the unified the theory of well, no. oh, the whole That's my first thought. <laughs> Oh, I'd like to start off by apologizing to Jeremy for that. Uh, <laughs> I thought, anyways. Um, <laughs> well, you were talking about uh, changing perspectives on China, and I think I, I want to start there. E Evan stole a little bit of my thunder, although I think when I was studying uh, the Soviet Union in the 80s, I think Evan was still in diapers. but. Um, I wore them till the age of 15. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> um, and I was fascinated by the Soviet Union as a, like a teenager. Um, in fact, when I was 12, I believe I did my first act of journalism, which was a, um, a fake newscast, Soviet news newscast, um, that uh, was extremely compelling, let me assure you, um, about the planned economy. Um, and that was my, and of, and of course I was terrified as well of nuclear annihilation, you know, the day after. These are things that dominated our psyche as, as kids. Um, and then when 89 comes around and Fukuyama's essay uh, comes out, the end of history comes out, uh, we studied it in high school. Um, at the time Tiananmen was happening. Uh, the wall comes down just after. Uh, and so my, my perception was, was similar to Evans. My perspective was similar to Evans, which was that uh, a system like China's, I mean, I fast forward to 2002, I did not um, study China, I did not go on to study China after that. Um, when I arrived as a foreign correspondent for the Baltimore Sun, my perspective was, okay, this system, you know, it's going to be around for a while, but it's gonna obviously inherently uh, unstable, it cannot endure for, for too long. I mean, I was, a, I was sort of a collapsist, um, but not like a, they'll collapse in 10 years, but just inevitably uh, that will be the case. Um, and I did read Gordon Cheng's book before coming to China. Um, and uh, actually, I'm gonna, I think I'm going to be in a meeting with him in a few weeks. So I'm looking forward to, to talking with him about that. Um, so I, I kind of, I looked at China's problems uh, and I covered my first year or two in China. I was going out to the countryside every couple of weeks. And there's no one unhappier uh, in China under the Communist Party than your average just villager in the countryside where they have to deal with, you know, the, the party, they're really under the party's thumb on, you know, their land, um, on, uh, you know, when, when, when there's corruption, when there's stealing of funds that are supposed to go to the village. Um, they're the ones who really end up on, on the wrong end of the stick. Whereas in the cities, you have the people who are sort of the relative winners of, of, uh, of Chinese prosperity. And that was especially the case when I, when I arrived in 02. 
Um, in 98, there's been a massive transfer of wealth uh, to urban apartment owners. And we were just beginning to see the, this you know, tremendous growth um, for the next decade. And I think that's another thing that I underestimated coming in as a foreign correspondent were the fundamental economic forces at play. Um, the uh, things were really tilted in China's favor demographically and economically at that point. And that was something I don't think um, that I fully grasped. And to give you a sense of how that changed, uh, you know, Jeremy talked about Lamborghinis now. In, in 2002, when I arrived, I felt like a, a bit embarrassed that I might be conspicuous with my uh, Chinese-made Volkswagen Jetta, um, whereas, uh, you know, I worried, that, <laughs> worried that I would, might, might look a bit overprivileged. Uh, and now, uh, 10 years later, uh, when I was leaving, or 12 years, 12 years later when I was leaving, um, I was the pauper uh, amongst princes with Lamborghinis and, and Ferraris all around Beijing. Uh, and, and in that time, my perspective changed. I, I did not suddenly decide that, um, you know, that liberal democracy is worse than um, an authoritarian system or an authoritarian, syst authoritarian system can be enlightened and brilliant. Uh, and I didn't suddenly become Tom Friedman. Um, but, uh, uh, but I saw that the system was, as Evan put it, um, adapting and had adapted. Uh, and I look at what Xi Jinping is, is doing now a, a little bit differently from Evan. We don't differ too much, but... Uh, Which Evan? The, this Evan. Oh, man. Okay. No, Evan and I, we hate each other. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, but I think, I, I think of... You talk about a standing committee member going to jail and Xi Jinping sort of, and he talks about Xi Jinping, accru uh, Bill talked about Xi Jinping accruing um, so much power, taking power over the, uh, over the security, or taking control of the security services uh, over the military. I see those as connected to uh, where we had a decade of collective leadership that seems to have gone, at least from Xi Jinping's perspective, and I think from some other elites' perspective, awry under Hu Jintao. Uh, in Wen Jiabao. You know, it's referred to within the party uh, by some as the lost decade. Uh, and I feel like the ability of Zhou Yangkong to amass so much power um, was a result of being able to exploit uh, the collective leadership model. And Xi Jinping, uh, I think, saw that and has decided uh, to uh, essentially uh, reassert power. I, I don't think he's changing all of the rules, um, but I think you know, he's rejected the collective leadership model that existed uh, previously, but I don't think he's rewritten all of the rules. So, I mean, it's... So tell, tell me then, I mean, how many of you think the kind of party strengthening, party rectification, whatever you want to call it, that's going on now, is actually reversing prior policies or changing things in a way that was not the case, say, 10 years ago? So I'll give you an example. You know, when, when Jiang was general secretary of the party, you have this three represents, then the idea was to bring the, the business establishment into the party. But when I look at what's going on now, I see people at the center of the party, starting with, with Xi, who say, actually, the, the party is the establishment. And so rather than bringing some ex external establishment into the party, we're going to, first of all, inject the establishment into other elements of the society. You mean so ex inject the party into other Exactly. So well, first you, you, you rectify, it's a one-party state, therefore if you're going to be a one-party state, we need to have a clean party, a self-regulating party, a well-managed party, thus we need to deal with corruption, we need to rectify. But what's more, uh, we need to alter the connections between business and politics in the first instance, but also the way the party relates to social organizations, private business, and others. So it's essentially standing some of what we saw previously on its head. I, well, I think because it's a different way of thinking about what's establishment. Well, part of it, I think, is you have the lessons that they've taken lots of lessons from the fall of the Soviet Union. And, and clearly one of the lessons was that um, you know, the party had become dissolute and flaccid and had sort of slacked off and had lost control of, of society and the economy. And so um, clearly she is putting the party back in command. I mean, well, there's the quote from one of his, the book that came out recently in his speeches where what's his quote about how, you know, it was it East, West, North, South, the party leads everything, right? And, and that's sort of a politics and command kind of approach that um, we haven't seen in a, in a very long time in China. And I think it's a reaction in part to um, also the Jasmine Revolution, which is sort of five years ago, this period where 
I think they looked at, because a lot of this stuff actually predates Xi, though. There was a lot of this sort of party strengthening that was beginning in the Hu administration. Xi actually, as, as in his role in the party, he was in charge of party construction. So this is also not a new thing for him. But I think a lot of it was also looking in 2011 at what was going on with democracy promotion in the Middle East. But as you, as you said, we saw all of this post-color post, post revolutions. You know, so 2004, or five. Hu Jintao was using much of the same language. It's just become, I think, well, But Xi Hu Jintao was not nearly as effective. I mean, she brings not, a sort exactly. of a, a much more vitality effective. Yeah. and a sort of a, a, a strength. And, a, and, a, and really, I think he's injected a ton of fear into mm -hmm. the system. And ultimately, he, you know, this only works with fear. And because they were under the Hu administration, nobody was afraid of anybody. Yeah, I also think, I mean, we talk a lot about the way that Xi Jinping regards the fall of the Soviet Union and Gorbachev. I think we should talk a lot about how he regards the previous 10 years. You know, Gotti described it as, and I agree, people talk about it as a lost decade. But when you dig into that, the sort of detail of the relationship between Xi Jinping and his cohort, and, you know, some of us can get really into um, understanding the difference between being born into the party, being of the revolutionary families and being not of the revolutionary families, that distinction often gets lost from far away. When you're looking at it from the US, you say, well, they're, you know, Jiang Zemin, Hu Jintao, what's the difference? Xi Jinping, they, they seem like they come out of the same pedigree. No, it's a, it's a profound difference. I mean, if you are Xi Jinping and you are a son of the revolution, you tend to look at the apparatchiks, and that's the way they would look at it. The guys, the hired hands is the term that's used in Chinese for the, for the uh, Jiang Zemin, Hu Jintao, Wen Jiabao, crowd and they say we lost our way we the party lost our way and so you know in some sense yes yeah, some of it was going on under Hu Jintao but I think there is a real feeling that Jiang Zemin in opening up to the business community and expanding the definition of the party to encompass all these other elements that there was a sloppiness that got in and that's I mean no, that's the underlying motive behind so much of what we've seen over the last couple of years is to try to bring the party back into its proper form it, it, and one Discipline. thing I mean I'll, I'll say I think you guys will probably agree is 2011, 2012, you know, be it Lamborghinis and other things at your doorsteps, whatever was going on, it really, I, it really felt like China was actually, it, would sort of this, it could sort of fly apart because mm -hmm. the corruption was so egregious, so yeah. ostentatious, so out of control that it, it, it was a, really quite, I mean, the economy was booming, people were making lots of money, but it was a really deeply unhealthy place. Uh, and Politically and socially. At the same time, you had social media becoming mm -hmm. a real force to be reckoned with. I mean, which, you know, the, I, you've, I think you first saw a reaction against it, the strong reaction in 2009 after the, you know, events in Iran, the so-called Facebook revolution, and then you had the ethnic riots in Xinjiang, and they shut down the internet for half a year and the entire uh, Xinjiang autonomous region, uh, as it's known. Um, and the Wenzhou train crash in 2011, I mean, for me, that's kind of the watershed event in terms of internet policy. Mm -hmm. Uh, because the party completely lost control of the narrative, mm -hmm. and there was a whole weekend when millions, you know, hundreds of millions of people were basically cussing out the government. <clears throat> and they clamped down after that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and, I, and, I, and it was before Xi Jinping came along that mm -hmm. all of this tightening began with the internet. I think she does bring a vitality to all of, to, to the party building, to discipline. Um, but I think a lot of that was in place before. And I, I would point to the what happens with, what's happened with security services. Because there is a narrative out there that from, that up until about the Olympics, uh, things were sort of loosening up in China. And I, I, I reject that. I, I think the high watermark for civil society in China uh, and openness or allowing uh, kind of which when uh, rights defense lawyers to to operate was 2003, um, and specifically the um, this case of Sun Zhigang, a migrant worker who was beaten to death in Guangzhou, um, and this became a moment of some triumph for uh, for the rights rights defense movement uh, when they were able to get uh, a law you know repealed and um, cha change the way migrant workers are are uh, changed and change the way migrant workers are treated. Uh, since then, uh, those lawyers have progressively been. Um, uh, hounded, jailed, disappeared, uh, more and more every year. Uh, and this was happening long before Xi Jinping came onto the scene. And it was under Lu Gan, who was talking about, um, you know, the, who was talking about hostile foreign forces and the influence of, um, of NGOs, uh, and he was talking about the 
kind of evils of the rights defense movement as early as 2004 and 5. Um, and then Zhou Yang Kang, uh, who, who was public security chief from 2002 to 2007 and now was running the whole show, I think only consolidated power more uh, in part by increasing the uh, repressive capacities of the security apparatus. So that is something that I think Xi Jinping has only actually continued. He just has taken it under his own, can, under can, his own wing. Can, can one of you make a link for me? We made this interesting transition to the conversation where we were, when we started down at Bill's end, we were really talking about elites and elites. Right, we we're talking about party rectification and discipline inspection teams going out to inspect on corruption. And then suddenly, as we worked our way down the panel, we were into social media and train crashes and the public becomes involved. So make the link between the public and elites. How much, when, I mean, you know, you have friends, you have family, you have friends of family, family of friends. Um, how, uh, t talk about how people look at in, in the public look at elite struggles or elite politics? Is it just, you know, kind of that's the party, that's elite stuff over there? Um, and maybe people become cynical about that? Or how do elite politics engage people's lives or not? And this gets at my question in the setup about how do people relate to this system? Do they relate to it as something far away and abstract or is it something that touches their lives? Um, yeah, any of you? Well, I, you know, I, we were all in Beijing. I, I was in Beijing for 10 years, and so it's a very skewed answer because Beijing is like D.C. I mean, people talk about politics all the time, right? And Beijing's a great place because there are all sorts of rumors in it, and sometimes they're true. So you have more an obsession with this kind of politics than you do and have in other parts of China. But certainly in Beijing, um, you know, I think that, that um, you, you know, the, the, the elite politics are, I mean, again, you're with people, you know, you have friends of friends or relatives or whatever who are in central government bodies, and so they're actually in many ways affected by sort of who, they've, who their bosses are or to whom they've sort of attached their, their political stars. Um, so there's a lot of attention paid to it um, in, in Beijing, at least what I, I mean, now though, the problem, one of the things that happened under Xi though, at least that I certainly felt, was that, you know, the Chinese politics have always been a bit of a black, actually quite a black box. Um, uh, and, and spawned a lots of good industries and businesses trying to explain Chinese politics. Um, the last couple of years, it's gotten to be a much darker black box where, where it's just much harder for, forget the foreigners, the people in Beijing to figure out what is going on. Because she, I think part of what he's doing and the way he has um, sort of built his strength is he's, he's centralizing, he's bringing everything in. So fewer and fewer people inside the system actually know what's going on. And so there seems to be a lot more uncertainty. And again, f fear now because of what, with the, with the corruption crackdown, the discipline, um, you know, the, the, you know, the Wang Xishan's leading this corruption crackdown, but you gotta remember that the body he runs, the Central Discipline and Inspection Committee, it's not just about corruption, it's also about discipline and ideological enforcement. And what you're seeing now, I think, in this next wave is more of a push on discipline and ideology. And so you, you've created this sense where um, people, you know, you want to know what's going on because, but, but you know, it, it's causing real problems to the economy too because people don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. Because it's much better to just, and then the default position is go into crouch, do nothing, or guess what? If we become, you know, we're in security services or we're in some ministry and we become tougher on the foreigners, well, that's a, probably a safe default position because no one's going to criticize us if we do that as opposed to sort of keep talking to foreigners, keep doing stuff, because then you, you expose yourself to far more problems. You know, I, I'm struck by hearing sort of, and this is fascinating for me to kind of see also all, refracted through all of our experience. We were all there at the same time, but we also touched different parts of the elephant. And um, the, you know, part of the challenge of reporting on elite politics is always that the people who know don't talk and the others talk. And so, you know, and I can, we can have another evening to talk about how different it is in Washington, D.C. Um, <laughs> but you know what, I'm, I, I'm really struck by looking back on that period. And I think that I, I, I mentioned this partly because I think there are people in this room who are studying China in the process of studying China and thinking about how much, how much weight do I put on my own experience, my own observations on the ground versus received wisdom, um, either that you read or that you hear about. And what I would say is trust what you see and trust what your, uh, what your gut tells you for the following reason. All of us living there in this period, 2008, 2009, 2010, we're beginning to hear about the impact of corruption from 
friends. You would hear about it constantly. You go anywhere, you scratch this far, and somebody will start to tell you about the problem of corruption. They can't get their child into the school. Right. They can't get their parent into the hospital. And it was, it was everywhere, and everybody was talking about it. And I remember coming back to the U.S. in 2000, I think it was 2011, I was talking about China with a group, and it was a, a sort of high-level group. These were CEOs, people who dealt with really sophisticated counterparts in China at a very high level in government and business. And they reacted violently to my description, of, not physically violently, but you know, they, <laughs> the, when I said, look, corruption is priority number one. Everybody's talking about it. It's a huge problem the party's going to have to deal with. And they said, look, look, none of my friends are involved in this stuff, and none of them are worried about this. You know, I had just the nicest dinner the other night in Paris. The guy's a lovely guy. $10,000 you know? bottle of ice cream, exactly. right? The yeah. guy was great. Right. Right. Exactly. Free, actually, right? Yeah, and he's, you know, his son's at Hotchkiss. Yeah, what yeah. could go wrong? Yeah. Choke, choke is the better choke. choke. But, I mean, it's very true that it depends very much on who you talk to. I mean, I, Bill and I have some friends in common in Beijing who do nothing but talk about elite politics, and uh, even if they don't know what's going on most of the time. <laughs> Makes it that's, better, right? <laughs> yeah. um, I mean, I, I work with a, a peasant farmer family in Hebei near Beijing on a kind of a rural tourism project, and they don't care what's going on in Beijing as long as the real estate project down the road doesn't steal their land, which is probably going to happen. Um, and, you know, they have a big picture of, of Chairman Mao on their wall, and they look fondly back on that time because they felt they had some respect. Uh, but that's about as involved as they are with elite politics, and they really don't care as long as it doesn't touch their own lives. I have some other friends in Beijing. What has struck me in the last couple of years, one of the few things that seems very positive is the number of young Chinese people that are uh, starting new companies, you know, mm -hmm. um, and taking risks to do it, which, you know, supposedly Chinese people didn't do. Um, and now you're seeing it. I mean, it's a real thing. I agree. And they don't seem to care about elite politics either, as long as the VCs keep giving them money. Um, so it's very difficult to say generally about China. I mean, it seems to very much depend on which group you're talking to. But how did it feel? I mean, you guys, I mean, you literally just left. How many months ago did you leave? Six months Six. ago. Yeah, right. Seven. So to your point, people don't care unless it touches their lives. Right. So is it touching their lives? And well, what's the it? Is, I mean, it? is it? My answer to that is that at the, it, it, like at the, it, all politics is local. And at the village level, yeah. they don't talk about elite politic, politicians, but they do talk about their village officials, their township officials who are screwing over them or their neighbors. Um, and so it, and it touches, uh, I think it touches the village level quite often because there's family planning, there's, uh, like I said before, land apportionment amongst families. There's causes for dispute uh, constantly coming up. And what they talk about are their local officials. Uh, and to, to the extent that they talk about, you know, whoever's in charge, Xi Jinping or Hu Jintao or Wen Jiabao at the time, it's because they're hoping that uh, maybe, you know, could you write about this and then, you know, maybe they'll hear about it and they'll change it, you know, and it's this whole, if only the emperor knew what was going on in this village. Um, and that's that's how I think locals and in, in, uh, more but often in rural China will see elite but politicians. But that's interesting because that suggests people still have hope that they can change. Well, it. this is the thing. So it's still an, it's not an age of. I do think that, and I, it's, I, it's, I think yeah. that it helps that they changed. You know, they they do change their top leader every ten years. Uh -huh. Otherwise, I think they I think that some of that faith would dissipate, uh, and did dissipate towards the end of the Hu Wen years. Good. Well, I was just going to say, I mean, I think you'd be, a lot of these phenomena can go in parallel. And that's one of the hardest things to right. convey in your writing or your analysis or your, whenever you're sort of thinking about China. It is absolutely true that you can have a party that is truly having um, a deep um, transformation, convulsion, whatever you want to call it. And at the same time, people that we know, I, I would say that of, of, sort of Chinese friends of mine, I've never seen more entrepreneurship than there is right now. Doesn't mean these companies are all going to work. Doesn't mean that they're going to, but there is not a sense that like this window has closed. I, I mean, everybody, it's almost comical. Some of people are just, everybody has a company going on the side at the moment, even more than the Well, there, and there's also so. conversely a sense that there is not as much opportunity abroad. Um, you know, that you can get educated abroad, but you, you're not going to, you're not going to be able to start a company abroad or even maybe get a good, a well, a well paying job abroad. You have to come back to China. Yeah. Bill, did you want to jump on this point? It's okay. It's okay. When, when, you, when, when you left, I mean, how did your Chinese friends react to you leaving? Did they say, oh, you're, you're, you're leaving because you want to make a change? Well, so or you're leaving because you're, changes, right? you've so, given up on the city? So this, what, is, this is one of the changes, right? It's like you were saying you had the Jetta, you know, when you showed up in 2002. I mean, when I showed up in 2004, it was still hard for a lot of my friends to come to America, both because it was expensive, but also because um, visas were hard to get. So now it's like, oh, yeah, we'll come visit you in America. 
Mm -hmm. You know, traveling all the time, you get to, you know, several friends got their 10-year multi-entry visa. It's completely changed sort of that sort of leaving. And so, so many of them have had kids, put kids into boarding school or college here or had friends who moved here. It, it is, so, so the idea, it's, 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 it's less of a sort of a, a gulf in terms of I'm leaving and, you know, I'll see you when I come back next year kind of thing. And so, but that I think opens up a lot of what you talk about in your book, which is it is a sense of possibility. And there's so much justified pride in what China has done in the last 10 years because now it's who doesn't travel overseas, right? I mean, I was just one anecdote. My, my, my mother-in-law still lives in Beijing and we've got, a, we've got a WeChat group of all the in-laws. And the other day they were mocking these friends from Beijing who'd moved to the U.S. like 12 years ago and, and they had said they were following Gong followers so they got asylum. And now they can go back to China, and, they, and the, the in-laws in Beijing are retired and traveling all over the world, and they're making fun. Oh, they're so thin, they're still working. You know, they can't come back to China, ha, ha, ha. Right? No, but I mean, but honestly, it's, it's the, there's, you know, the change has, has, in so many ways, has been positive. So, so the extent that, you know, what I said earlier was negative, it's, it's more of, I think, a, um, it's a sense, it's not a sense that China's in class, but it's going in a direction that we all talked about, which was, I mean, if you haven't read Jim Mann's book, he's in the audience, yeah. China Fantasy, that he wrote in 2006 or 2007, which really addresses this issue. Very prescient book, but I think that's what we're seeing, which is a lot of, I certainly had the expectations that it was headed towards a more open um, society, more, you know, a little more like us, right? The very naive view. And I think part of the reaction that I certainly have had is, well, actually, that's not what they want. Did you all have that view? Maybe I'm just dark and cynical. And I didn't have that view. Yeah. I didn't think it was going to become like a like Trump kind of prosperous or, or open, but uh, more of a sort of it was going to kind of go the Taiwan path or the South Korea path, more of a more liberalized and the party ultimately, the party would fade into the background. I think what we're seeing too, which is hard, is the party is back and the party is back in its full glory. And for not just foreigners, but for a lot of Chinese people, that's actually a fairly disturbing thing right now. And I, I do think for China watchers, the Xi Jinping era has been disillusioning for for some, the non-cynics, basically. Um, uh, I suppose I was, I was a cynic, because to me, Xi Jinping is kind of bringing into sharp relief uh, the authoritarian superstructure that was always there. I know he has and made, refining it and expanding yeah, it and strengthening uh, it. He's tinkering with it, of course, uh, and I think making it much more effective, uh, at least in the short and midterm. I mean, that you can awesome. argue about whether that whether that's good for the, author, for the authoritarian system's stability long-term, but um, but I think you know, he thinks he's being pragmatic, pragmatic about keeping the party in power. I, I think I'm probably more cynical than anyone else on the stage. But I, in 2003, you. which um, <laughs> was, the, I would the, you, on uh, that. you know, I agree with Gandhi. That was sort of the high point of you know the idea that there might be a civil society in in, in China. I started a, a business that was a website. Um, publishing openly in China, trying to make it as a media business, you know, owned by a foreigner, i.e. me, which was obviously an incredibly um, naive um, and uncynical thing to do. So uh, <laughs> I was, you know, proven what a dumb idea it was. It was blocked in 2009. And, uh, and what Xi Jinping has done is made it much more obvious that that would have been a stupid thing. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I wouldn't do it again. No. Anybody who hasn't heard it, you can hear Jeremy talk about that experience on This American Life, which he did very eloquently a few <laughs> years ago. I, I will say one thing, which is when I left China, um, my neighbor, uh, I said, I'm moving back to the United States. She said, ah, be careful. You're going to get shot. <laughs> that is real. That is real. That's, that's, that's a real... And, um, and Good the, advice. Yeah, no, she was onto something. And then, I mean, I, I think... If you talk to people who are involved in civil society work in China, yeah, this is as dark a time place. as it's been. And that's the part that gives me pause, because that's been so essential to what China has become on its, at its best moments. And I don't know where this leads. I don't see how this moment moves us into a period of something um, stronger. Mm -hmm. you know? And I use that word sort of advisedly. Yeah. Well, that, there is the risk in making it more kind of starkly authoritarian is um, they actually, despite the fact that things like Weibo have been a, very, a big challenge to the regime, uh, by maybe luck or happenstance, uh, that has exposed some uh, cracks that they were able to then fix. You know, and that is part of adaptive authoritarianism, is uh, you need to actually kind of see what your problems are. And the more that they uh, crowd out civil society, the more that they censor, um, 
this does help them in the short term in terms of con consolidating the party's power, but it does hurt them, I think, in covering up problems. And uh, I think that's, that's where it, it could come back to bite them. So we, we could do this all night. In fact, we used to <laughs> over a couple of beers. But I, I want to get the audience involved. So maybe, maybe let me just ask you one more thing. So you, now we're in Washington. What do you, um, what do you think Washington people, Washington people get wrong about China that you say to yourself, oh, if only they, you know, people here had spent a decade in China. They'd know what I know. And what, what is it that you know that you think people? Evan, you have the most experience of this. Yeah, yeah, this. yeah, yeah. Where you start. Out with uh, it. It's a hard one. I mean, I, I think um, it's not an original observation to say that we tend to nudge China into some satisfying role. Like it's either conspiring to keep the United to deprive the United States of its primacy in the world, or it is um, you know doomed to fail. And I don't fault sort of Washington for that. I think um, that's the that's the tendency from far away. It's actually a harder question than it sounds. I've really yeah. struggled with this, and I'll you know I'll probably try to work it out on the page at some point. Um, but uh, I, I don't have a satisfying way of explaining what Washington gets wrong about China. I can tell you what Donald Trump gets wrong. <laughs> but I'm hoping that doesn't mean what Washington gets wrong. About. You're going to write a follow-up. Yeah. yeah. Any, any of you other guys want to take a shot at that? Or? Uh, I, I mean, uh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, I mean, I live in Tennessee, and some people don't know the where real China America. is. So. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'll tell you what Washington gets wrong. Is there's no good Chinese restaurant here. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Honestly, That's is true. anyone? That's our first My kids, my kids won't even. We won't, They won't even go to a Chinese restaurant now because they say, "Daddy, we don't like Chinese food in America. Every time we eat there, we want to puke." <laughs> Come to New York. Come yeah, to New York. Yeah, I know. I mean, it's 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 astounding how 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 what a what a what a um, desert of Chinese food this town is. And I think actually better Chinese food might make for better discourse and understanding. This is the most, this is the most no, impassioned seriously. position we've taken as a group. Go back to, like, Mr. Go back to the Mr. K days, right? Back to the old, uh, the old K All right. days. With that, why don't, we, why, don't, why don't we open it up? So if folks have questions, wow, a lot of hands. Uh, let's start here. And if you could just identify, say something about who you are. Sure, I'm Bethany. Why don't you wait for the mic? I'm Bethany Allen Abrahamian. I'm an assistant editor at Foreign Policy Magazine, which is just a, a few minutes walk away. Um, it's been great hearing what everyone has to say. I've, I've, it's been amazing, especially hearing you know everyone up there talk with each other, you know, sort of ask each other questions. Um, I, I do feel that in some ways, talking about the you know the political situation or the political atmosphere in China. Uh, that it's been maybe a little bit too pessimistic because if you if you talk to you know young Chinese people or you see a lot of what people are writing online, um, I did spare, spend four years in China myself. That there's a lot of optimism about the way that po politics are heading in China because for the finally someone is doing something about corruption. That thing that in 2009 everyone was talking about all the time. And when you talk to people, you know. Finally, I think that Xi Jinping actually is really doing something. He's not just talking about it. You know, at Foreign Policy, we did a, a survey of about um, two or three hundred Chinese students here in the U.S., um, at ch Chinese college students, and we asked them, one of our questions was, you know, do you feel that, do, you know, coming to the U.S., do you have a more positive view of China, a less positive view, or has it stayed the same? And overwhelmingly, or not overwhelmingly, but definitely the majority of people said that they have a more positive view, and a reason for that is that they feel more optimistic about China's future um, in regards to the political direction. So if you have any comments you know, about that, thank you. Yeah. Um, Bethany, by the way, fan of your work at Foreign Policy. Yeah, um, uh, I think that's a very good point. I don't think any of us would be talking, we're, we're talking about uh, Xi Jinping's popularity within China. Um, and it is often said that he's very popular um, on the street. And I think that probably hasn't changed. Uh, and I think the anti-corruption campaign has been incredibly popular, as far as we can, we can tell. Uh, I think the, the pessimism is more from the perspective of like, this, the, the, we know a lot of the civil society actors who are being put in jail, uh, being hound, you know, forced out of the, into exile if they're lucky enough to leave the country before they get put into jail or disappeared. Um, and it's just, it's a dark view about, uh, you know, what, what is, what, is, what kind of life can you lead if you want to pursue uh, advocacy or, you know, rights defense, you know, to protect someone's rights in court, um, you know, rule of law. I think it's more, it's, a more, it's a more pessimistic view about that than it is about, you know, whether Xi Jinping is 
quote unquote, doing a good job or not. What about Bethany's point about sense of movement? Right, Some, as somebody said, lost decades. If it was a lost decade and now things are moving wherever they may be moving to, I mean, you made this point that there's a palpable sense of motion to somewhere in motion mm -hmm. in itself. He is doing things. Yeah. He is doing things. Yeah. And I mean, one, one thing that I think is, is again, I mentioned earlier how there's a, a real justifiable, justifiable pride about you know, what China has become and, and, and how far they've come, how far the country has come. You know, a lot of it, though, sort of is there's also, you know, we have to look at the patriarchal education campaign that was put in after Tiananmen Square, um, which it seems like they're actually starting to double down on. I mean, there's, there's a real, you know, nationalism is, can be good and nationalism can be justified. I think there's, there's a bit, there are pockets where we're bordering on, I think, a bit too, um, getting kind of scary in certain areas. And, but if you look at from the perspective of a lot of my friends, and some of the biggest arguments I have with my friends in China who I'd known for, for 20 years and who have kids in the U.S. and some have foreign passports, have business interests here, when it came to South China Sea, when it came to you know, the East China Sea, it was all about what's America's problem? Why, why do you care? They're ours. They've been ours for thousands of years. Get out of the way and then everything's fine. And so there's, there's a real, you know, she has really, you know, even more tapped into this sense of resurgence and this real narrative that is widely held that, you know, we are returning to our rightful place. You could really world. say he's the Donald Trump of, of China. <laughs> With better hair. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that. All right, let's go. Let's get down that. I, and actually, he's <laughs> probably smarter. You profiled both, Evan. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah, that's <laughs> Yeah, we're trying to get them together for a, <laughs> That'd be a good event. Big draw, that event. Big draw. All right, let's go down front here. Here's Richard. <laughs> First row. <clears throat> um, I'm Kelly Curry from Project 2049. Um, I have so many things that I could ask you guys about, but I'm going to take it kind of simple. And you haven't talked much about quality of life as individuals with your families. And, you know, if you want to connect that to the broader political <coughs> system, that's fine. Or if you just want to talk about it as, you know, daily life, living there, and what role that played in your decisions to leave. And then would you go back? Under what circumstances? So Jeremy and I were the only ones who had little kids, right? Yeah. Baby. It's mine are, mine are almost 10. We have twin girls. And yours? You're one and three and a half. Three. Um, certainly for me, it was, it, at the end, it was, it was on the list. I, I didn't mention it because I, I sort of assumed that's mm -hmm. the fault for everybody, right? It's sort of why bore you guys with the, the air's bad. But um, clearly it's, it's bad and maybe gotten a little bit better, but not good enough. And it's going to be at least a generation before it gets better if everything they're trying to do works. I mean, I, I, I'll stipulate, yeah, I think the air quality was, is certainly part of it. We wanted to have, you know, kids who wanted to move back to the U.S. and kind of, also, I'd just been overseas for 11 years, and if I stayed out too much longer, I was going to get weird. Err. <laughs> yeah. uh, so, too late. Too at late. a certain point, you know, <laughs> got to bring it. But so the, the thing that I think sometimes gets lost in this discussion, and I think it, this may ring true to people who've lived in China, is that it is a, it is a place that is, it envelops you. I mean, it brings you in and kind of holds you there because your interactions with people tend to be very positive. And sure, as journalists, we've all had interactions where we go out and the local officials are not enveloping us with positivity. Uh, <laughs> but that's the thing about it is that, you know, even though, and I, I allow these two ideas to kind of cohabitate that I think China is becoming more nationalistic. I think that uh, the views around South China Sea and other issues are becoming the seeds of a deeper conflict with the United States in the long run. And yet at the same time, I have these really warm and sort of congenial experiences with Chinese people all the time. And those two things we haven't squared yet. Because if we're trying to understand, well, what's the future of, of US-China as a potential site of confrontation, we haven't squared the, the, the fact that actually on a personal level, there is deep affinity and, and warmth. And so I haven't solved that problem in my own mind, but I sort of put that as a big piece of the, uh, of the puzzle. Mm. Yeah. Let's, get a, let's get a few more. Uh, let's go here, please. Yeah. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, my name is Masaki Sakamoto, an uh, uh, international student from Japan, currently studying at American University. Um, my question is about the relationship, future of the relationship between the Taiwan and China. Um, as you talk about, um, uh, I mean, that the currently the, in Taiwan, the you know, political situation is very changing now. And uh, also, um, at, on the other hand, China is, you know, keeps the economy growing. And so, um, 
very simple question. What do you think about the future of the Taiwan and the China relationship? Did any of you cover Taiwan while you were there? Did yeah. You, did you go frequently? Uh, not frequently. But, but you, uh, you covered Taiwan? Covered Taiwan uh, a bit. Um, so why don't you take this one and make it a little more personal, too? Um, you, people talk about each other on both sides. Of the well, to, to me, actually, the relevant uh, kind of test case for how the party might view the relationship with Taiwan long term in recent years is how the party treated Hong Kong um, with the Umbrella Revolution or movement or what you would want to call it. Uh, and that to me, that kind of hard line that, uh, which I, was, not, was to me entirely predictable, um, uh, that the party has taken with Hong Kong indicates that uh, we're not going to see much flexibility on, on Taiwan uh, and that I think the long term prognosis is uh, more probably with Tsai Ing-wen uh, now um, uh, being elected, uh, which was expected, I think, for the last year or two, that it would be a DPP um, uh, administration, uh, that uh, I think it's going to be more hostile and economically, uh, more economic pressure from, from the mainland, uh, more economic strangulation of Taiwan, if necessary, in the long run. I don't know how patient Xi Jinping uh, will decide to be about Taiwan, um, but I don't. I don't really see much room for some sort of bargain or a uh, uh, great uh, uh, kind of pact that opens up uh, relations between across the straits. So. Let's get a bunch more uh, right in the middle here. You choose. <laughs> Contending hands. Okay. Ladies go first in my country. Okay. <laughs> oh, very nice. Well done. Why don't we take? Nice. Go. Nice. We'll, we'll take. We'll take two at a time in this instance. So. We're too great to we? Yeah. Um, my name is Zhao Ying. I'm an alumna of SAIS. Um, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, I I don't know how much you guys are familiar with the word Xiao Fen Hong. It might be translated as the Little Pink Army. Uh, after Tsai Ing Wen was elected. Uh, as a Taiwanese president, thousands of uh, Chinese netizens, mostly young people, they got their VPNs, um, they got on the Facebook page of Tsai Ing-wen and some other Taiwanese media. They leave thousands of comments, um, maybe criticizing the reportings of the Taiwanese media, and also just basically names of Chinese food. They said this kind of um, communication caused the straight. Um, you guys just talk about um, like the tightening of the internet and uh, the increasing uh, influence of social media and uh, the less political sensitive uh, Chinese um, young people are growing. But all these things seem to coexist. We have the little pink army, they're growing and they are very um, articulate. How do you see this phenomenon? How, how do we explain that how, is it like Chinese people are turning left, especially the young people? Um, they know how to get out from the, uh, great, the great fire war. But when they get on the so-called free internet war, they get on Facebook, they still speak what they believe, which is what the Chinese par uh, Communist Party um, is speaking in their propaganda. Well I mean, I certainly don't know anybody in my circle in Beijing who doesn't think Taiwan is part of the PRC. And that ultimately, you know, the, 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 so there's a sense of, you know, they go, they go on the VPNs, they go and they leave messages on Facebook, but it's all about how, you know, you, you're part of China, you're part of the PRC. And, you know, I think to the other question about, I mean, there's this fundamental tension because Taiwan has built a free and prosperous uh, society and it's, it's taken a very different route than the PRC. And the younger generation, you know, best I can tell, has very little interest in being part of the PRC. And so, but you have this, you know, I mean, even my kids, my kids went to a local Beijing primary school for first through third grade. Even their textbook in third grade was about how Taiwan was part of China, right? And so, I mean, there's just, from beginnings of primary school, you're told that Taiwan is something to be brought back into the PRC. And so there's a lot of, I mean, why, you know, most people aren't gonna question that. I, the, I've, I don't think I've ever seen a more fundamental disconnect between what Taiwanese people and mainlanders are, are saying about this question than in the last couple of years. I mean, um, I, I have some Taiwanese friends who uh, I have never felt more distant from the mainland 
And uh, same experience as Bill, my mainland friends, even ones who hold, you know, in other areas, liberal opinions, are absolutely hew to the party line when it comes to Taiwan. It's really an incredible disconnect and is a problem, I think. Uh, it, will be, it will continue to be a problem. It will get worse. I, I, I do have a couple of mainland friends who actually think Taiwan should, uh, should not be part of the PRC. But, uh, but that, that's definitely. But it's an unusual view. It, right? it is unusual. It's unusual. It's unusual. All right, let's get, I, I want to go around the room because I see the, one. Well, I'll, 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 let me come back. I just don't want to keep doing so from the same three rows. Yeah. So let's go all the way, sure way, is. way back there. <laughs> just so everybody gets a chance. This Hi, how are you doing? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm a Daniel Young. I'm a SAI student. I actually just came back from spending some time in uh, Southeast Asia. And it was interesting uh, hearing how uh, Chinese view themselves because one of the things I was shocked about is how much Southeast Asians, especially overseas Chinese, Singaporeans, straight Chinese, et cetera, hate mainlanders, and because of the tourists. And I'm wondering, I mean, this is beyond a public diplomacy problem, and um, I'm wondering how that's going to, how that aspect of domestic politics will continue with uh, China's relations with uh, Southeast Asian countries. Thank well, you. Look, can we, why don't we grab, well, let's grab a few more questions and then we'll, here, let's go, let's go here. I just, there's so many hands, I want to get two or three at a time and then let's go here in the middle. Hi, my name is Ray Winborn and I work at MPIA, Emerging Markets Private Equity Association. Uh, a couple of you mentioned that you've seen more entrepreneurship in the past few years than uh, you'd ever expect to see. And at MPIA, we've also recorded not only a large number of startups, but startups that get funding. Um, in 2015, 75% of the deals um, in China were for uh, venture capital and uh, around 40% of the capital. So where do you think this is going, especially with the large valuations that you're seeing with uh, and the Jinping, Meituan, uh, uh, all of these kind of large e-commerce businesses getting these larger and larger funding rounds? Uh, do you think it's going to implode soon? All right, let's get one more. Here, I'll come back here. <laughs> And then we're gonna do we're gonna do three at a time, and then the you guy guys can pick and choose. Yeah, you get the ship over sky. Um, I have a pretty predictable decision to disrupt question. Uh, the question is, um, uh, in your opinion, having uh, left China after uh, probably experiencing some of the harsher parts of uh, the new political uh, leadership and so on and so forth. Uh, do you feel, do you see that China is now uh, probably like? Imagine like a, t a couple of kids in a family and one of them was uh, much stronger and another one went to the gym, worked out, be became ripped and is just not going to take it uh, anymore and uh, is going to be much more uh, assertive with regard to foreign policy, with regard to uh, asserting its own sovereignty and so on and so forth. So uh, the conflict uh, in some respect is going to be inevitable. Uh, because as you see, the uh, rhetoric is becoming more combative. Uh, we see the anti-access uh, area denial, um, of military buildup uh, increasing all over the place. Um, and uh, yeah, maybe you have a more uh, optimistic perspective on that because uh, listening to the realistic school of uh, international relations is just like uh, the silent moment before the storm. Thank you. All right, who wants to have a... Do you sound optimistic? Those. Can I merge? I want to merge two questions. One is the question about whether tourism in Southeast Asia, Chinese tourism, is contributing to negative sentiment. I think, I mean, for one thing, I think as Americans, we, we alienate a lot of people when we went abroad and, you know. Um, still do. We still do. As, uh, <laughs> thank you. Um, Thanks, Charlie. <laughs> so I, I do think this is just a feature of being a country in its, in its early stage of venturing out. and. Um, I tend to think, you know, I, if you spend time with Chinese tourists, you find that there's not a, it's not a, an intent to offend. It's just, um, 
there's a lot of new experiences going on. So I tend, to, I mean, I'm hopeful, but I, I think it sort of moves along the curve fairly fast. People tend to be mortified when they discover that they've embarrassed themselves in this new place. And you know, because um, you went on a package tour. And there's, yeah. shame, there's shaming on tiny social media. Yeah, there is. There's um, really been, it's yeah. been well, sort of amazing. there's a blacklist now. Right? Yeah, I mean, it's uh, been amazing to watch. The numbers yeah. are just so huge. More than 100 million Chinese uh, every year now travel. I mean, yeah. so you're going to get a lot of these stories, but I also think you're going to have a learning curve. So I, I tend to think, actually, though, that, the, that there, but I agree very much that there is this underlying tension between mainland China and countries in Southeast Asia. I think, you know, it may, it may at the moment settle on the issue of tourism, but it has to do with things that go back a very long way. And I think in a, in a way that actually ties into the question about the future of U.S. Chinese competition in Asia, because we don't often talk that much, or we should talk more about how does the rest of Asia factor into that. Um, because the ways in which China is or is not able to build a meaningful sort of center of political gravity in Asia will shape to some degree its relationship with the United States. But, but, but aren't they, I mean, they are binding Southeast Asia to the Chinese economy very quickly. I mean, are, are, you, you wrote an essay a couple years ago about sort of what the security Asia, Asia, economic Asia, security. economic Asia, and, and so, I mean, it, it, it. They are, but but I mean. Uh, they may not like the people, but they like the money, and they like. They the like business, the money, right? but sometimes the sometimes a project is announced, it doesn't get finished, and uh, some other country comes in and finished, like Japan has come in and finished uh, some projects the Chinese started. Uh, I would say from the U, from what I've heard from the U.S. Uh, perspective is that uh, you know, the ASEAN countries are sort of falling into America's lap because of the way that... Except Thailand. Um, okay, except Thailand. Uh, but because of the way that China has been, has been treating its neighbors. So on a political level, uh, you know, they've never been seen more openness uh, to working with America um, in some of these countries. The one thing I would be careful with, the one caveat I would have is I think, you know, is China, is, is China trying to leverage trends in Asia to its strategic and economic advantage. Absolutely. But it is piggybacking on a lot of deeper trends among Asians mm -hmm. and Asian economies and Asian governments and countries that go back decades. And what I sometimes say to people is that we have to be careful about bilateralizing as a US-China competition things that have very deep roots in Asia. You know, the president in the State of the Union has this very interesting line. He said, if he, if he was talking about the TPP. And he said, if the United States doesn't write the rules, China will write the rules. And my view on that is he's, he's got it half right. If the United States doesn't write the rules, somebody else will write the rules. But for the reasons you guys just said, there are lots of Asian governments and publics that have no interest in living under a Chinese dictated set of rules. So the problem is not that China will write the rules, but that I think many in Asia will write the rules collectively together. And the United States, for whatever reason, will absent itself from that. Asian connectivity, for example, did not start in 2013 with the Belt and Road. It didn't spring like Athena from Zeus's right. head from Xi Jinping. It is the product of the actions and choices of a lot of countries in Asia. I mean, before there was an Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, Asian Monetary Fund, that was a Japanese idea in the 1990s. Who's building the infrastructure in India? It's mainly Japan with JBIC Finance, I can say. So Asia is changing, and the United States risk becoming less relevant. And China's piggybacking on some of that, but I, I think we need to be careful about over-determining that. I don't know if that makes sense. I'd like to ask, uh, answer the question about the startups, um, yeah. so, something I've been thinking about quite a lot recently. I mean, I think it's unquestionable that there's a lot of money sloshing around the, the tech scene, the internet scene in China. And much of it is irresponsibly invested. And as the inevitable slowdown of the Chinese economy happens, which I mean, I don't think there's any question about. You know, I think people are arguing about how much it's going to slow down. But everyone from Xi Jinping to Gordon Chang thinks that it's going to slow down. Um, so some of that money is going to be lost, and those, a lot of those businesses are going to go out of business. I also think you have to be careful with a, a lot of the hype. And I'd like to, uh, to focus on one particular example, which is WeChat, which just about every week you see a, an article in the Western mm -hmm. tech press usually about WeChat is this incredible thing and it's just taken over the world and it's great and you can do payments and you can do this and people say oh it's so much better than I, Apple iPay and, and a lot of the reason for that is you know I realized after coming to the United States having been an entrepreneur in China my entire adult life having been paid and paid people in literally cash for most of that time that I carried around in brown envelopes 
uh, you know, a country which, I mean, now there's a pretty good debit card network, but credit cards are still pretty new. Pretty much no such thing as a personal check. I get to America and I'm like, oh wow, there's this piece of paper I can just put in my bag and if I need to pay someone while I'm walking around, it's like a mobile payment. I just sign it and <laughs> give them the check and then it's, it's a mobile payment, which you don't have in China, which is one of the reasons why WeChat payments, you know, have taken off so quickly. So there's a lot of hype about innovation that to me doesn't quite make sense because they're things that are going on that are basically, um, you know, they've they never built as many big box malls as you have in America. People aren't in the habit. So young people are much more in the habit of, of, of shopping online. And you know, certain things have developed faster because of that. So I mean, I, I don't think it's going to go away. I think the Chinese internet, uh, at least is you know, not necessarily for saying what you think about Xi Jinping, but for buying stuff, um, is, is going to be you know, pretty amazing. And many of these startups will go somewhere. Uh, but a lot of them are going, going to go out of business. And I, I, whenever there's an article about Alibaba is going to take over the world, I'm like, well, no. Um, <laughs> and as far as, I mean, uh, frenzied investing and overvaluations is just, that's a part of the part of the game with venture capital, I think. And I, we've seen it in China in several cycles. I used to work for Forbes and remember one from, you know, like the 09, 10 time frame. Before that, there was probably an 05, 06. There was a 90, you know, 95 to 98. Yeah, you know, and, yeah. Every, and then that shakes out. A lot of companies fail. And then there's a new excitement that builds, um, and especially when new technologies come along and social media or whatever it is. And now e-commerce has become mature. Uh, then you're going to get, you know, a lot more people with ideas for businesses. But, but specifically to your question, I think also you saw in 2000, late 2013, in the sort of middle of 2014, you saw a lot of um, frenzied investing because people were making so much money in the stock market and the, the, the multiples for on the, on the tech board were insane. And so a lot of people assumed that, okay, you know, I, I can sew it up, it's worth a billion now, but as long as I can list it on, you know, the China next in Shenzhen, then it's going to be worth 10 billion in a year. And, you know, there's always a lag, right? But so, so you got a lot of, I think you've got a lot of companies that are going to, um, got way overvalued up in, into sort of Q3 2014 and, or 2000, 2015, sorry. Um, and it's going to be, uh, it's going to be a pretty rough time in the next, yeah, unless the stock market comes roaring back, but you know, even my mother-in-law has finally given up. Um, she was sort of my last, might be a lot of because she, oh, she was believing the party, yeah. she, they'll save the market all the way, she wrote it up, she wrote it down, and now she's sort of... All right, Bill, we want to see a blog sick. of your mother-in-law's uh, investment op uh, observations. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm looking at the clock, so let's take, let's take another, let's take four in a row. I'm going to do it one from each section, so let's do one here. Uh, hey, my name is Winslow Robertson. I do China Africa consulting. One belt, one road. What's the deal with that? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, here in the middle. Uh, thanks, guys. Uh, my name is Chris Gregg. I'm a second year China studies student here. Lived in China for about the same period that you all did, so I'm glad to hear you articulate a lot of the ideas that I've been trouble, having trouble uh, figuring out. Um, I want to ask about uh, the sort of, I want to make one quick comment first and then ask a question. About the, um, what did your friends say when you left China? Um, I was back in China this, uh, this winter break and had a, a pretty profound uh, experience of people sounding very pessimistic, kind of sharing a lot of the points of view that have been shared on stage tonight. And, and their sort of view about me leaving China was like, you're really lucky. You have the chance to leave China. A lot of my Chinese friends are, that see what's going on and see what's happening feel, oh, uh, I'm kind of stuck here. How do I how do I manage this? So there's definitely a more kind of pessimistic side to what the the young lady from Foreign Policy magazine said earlier. Um, my question is about sort of the intersection of the economic slowdown and and uh, Evan, you referred to the um, the the Hong Ar Dai, the what the second red generation, and then these other I won't call them reformers, but not uh, not as hardline as she. And as the economy continues to slow down. Um, I mean, 2015 was just full of failures, bond market, stock market, foreign exchange market, everything is a, a big confusion what's happening right now. If, as the economy continues to slow and this tension between market reforms and the, the party-led, state-led uh, allocation of resources and, and, and driving of the economy happens, is there a chance or an increased chance of, I know speculating about elite politics is always a, a fun but uh, a difficult thing to do, but it seems to me there's, a, there's definitely a, a lot of people in China who see what's happening, recognize that they need these economic reforms, 
uh, real economic reforms. You hear the supply side reforms talk now, but if there's not a significant change in the approach to managing the economy, the, the second red generation is gonna quickly lose that authority. And my, my question is, are we gonna have a breaking of, of uh, political factions in the party? Or how are they gonna cope with this if two, three, four years from now, we're still kind of six, five, four percent growth. So right. thank you very much. Um, let's take two more, I'm gonna, and then I'm gonna call time and I feel terrible because there's so many hands, but uh, we're up at time. So let's take one here, second row here, and then. Thank you, I'm Allison Friedman from Ping Pong Productions. We bring China and the world together through the performing arts. Uh, but my question is tying it back to DC and your, I would love to hear your reflections on the election cycle and how that is impacting and will impact US-China relations and if you'd like to give predictions. Okay, and one so more. to win the election? <laughs> well, how that would, if, okay. depending on who wins, how that would affect it. All right, one more, and this will be the last one. Sorry, right here. Why don't you wait for the mic? My name's Kate Sliney. Um, I'm a second year here at SICE, big fan of all you guys. Thank you for coming and speaking with us. My question is, um, you know, if you could comment on uh, how Sorry. successful do you think, Thanks. we've talked about kind of the adaptability of the party, adapt with authoritarianism, how, if, if you're willing to make any sort of quasi-prediction, how successful do you think that will be, continue to be in the future? We talked about the kind of the, the limiting of the people who are closest um, and so, you know, what kind of information can get up to the top in order to be adaptive? So if you're willing to make any of those predictions or any comment on that, uh, I'd, I'd love to hear it. Thank you. All right. We got four questions. I'll, I'll answer one answer. question about U.S. politics. I knew that, that was going to be uh, Take the easy uh, one. Well, partly because it's a chance to, to remind our, our, uh, ourselves of, of our host, Paulson Institute, because I had a, a conversation with, with Hank Paulson in New York when a few months ago. Uh, uh, at the Asia Society, and one of the questions that I asked him was, this was a, when his book was coming out, I said, so what would you like to hear U.S. presidential candidates, this was before the campaign started, what would you like to hear U.S. presidential candidates say about China during the campaign? And he said, as little as possible. <laughs> I, I think he's turned out to be right. Uh, very little of what's said on the campaign trail enhances our understanding of the Well, world. what's the upside of saying anything reasonable? You could use that to describe right. the entire campaign. Right, but, but honestly, yeah. and so, but especially when it comes to China, <laughs> it's easy. The harder you hit, the better you're gonna, you know, yeah, you're but better this is a out. critical national security issue, an I, economic and competitiveness issue for the United States. Shouldn't we want our presidential candidates talking about this? I, I would say, I, I do think I mean, you'll notice, though, in the State of the Union, about? there was a lot less discussion of China than there has been in the past, yeah. which is kind of notable. Um, the Meaning, not that I think the relationship is suddenly solved, but I just don't think it, it serves the same function that it did politically. I think the candidates have gone, you know, way further this time around in, in beating up on China. Um, you know, I, I don't think it really it says all that. It doesn't much. really register, right? I mean, yeah, I, you know, I've seen some China's Chinese counterparts come over and they ask about, you know, these are experts on U.S. politics, and they all have sort of a furrowed brow. And I, they'll, at, at the end of one of these meetings. Um, they were trying to make sense of this incredibly complicated and sort of dizzying landscape in the US. And the one question from the expert on US politics uh, that she asked, she said, well, will Marco Rubio's credit card problems bring him down? And I thought to myself, I mean, I admire your effort to like make some sense of this thing. Um, and I said, yes, yes, they will. <laughs> All right, we had, these two questions were kind of linked. Here. Well, I, I would I mean, just say on that one, I think, um, you know, again, living in Beijing, you end up knowing lots of interesting people. I certainly, from my, my limited um, sort of, we had some friends who would count as like Hong San Dai or kind of people. Um, to a person, there was a ton of support for Xi, and one of the reasons was, hey, this is our last shot. It's such a mess in 2012. Mm. If, if he can't figure this out, it's done. The party's over. It will, it will finally, it will collapse. And so, I think he has had a lot of support um, in the, the whole RDI. And I think to Evan's point earlier, it's still, you know, a lot of the problems they're dealing with are problems that were basically arose under Wen Jiabao and Hu Jintao, right? I mean, mm -hmm. you could very, still very easily go back and look at overcapacity, the debt, all this stuff, and basically point right to Wen Jiabao and, and say, this is your, this, you guys created this mess. Or and Jiang Zemin. So, or double or, or Jiang, Well, and Jiang Zemin gets a lot, of, you know, Jiang Zemin gets a lot of the wrath for the corruption. You know, one of the things you hear a lot of Beijing and you take it for what it's worth is sort of people like to, sort of 
talk and backstab is that, you know, Jiang Zemin really created the, the bigger corruption problem because he needed to buy his way mm -hmm. into power. Mm -hmm. And so he, he's the one who, he allowed the corruption to run rampant in the military. He created the, you know, allowed the, 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 the creation of the Joe Hong Kong kind of thing because it was all his way of basically keep them happy, let them make their money, they'll, he'll get the support that he didn't, he didn't really have the political chops or political base to actually be a strong general secretary. And of course he ended up being quite a strong general secretary, including through the Hu Jintao era. Um, and so I think that, um, to your point, I don't think we're at the point where she's going to turn around and be blamed for these problems. And all of a sudden people say, okay, see, you failed, you know, let's go find someone else. I also think, though, that when you look at sort of the politics, and, and you, can't, you can't pull away from what he did. We, we, the way he prosecuted the, the beginnings of the corruption crackdown, security services, PLA. He has the sources of hard power. So that even if people want to blame him or somehow want to say, you know, okay, you messed up, Who's going to challenge him mm -hmm. at this point? Now, it's not impossible, right? And, and making predictions about China is a fool's game. But I would certainly put a lot of money on the fact that he, he was, he's obviously a very, very smart guy. He knows, how to, he knows how to fight the political battles. He has gotten himself a position where he's bought himself a lot of time because he is, he is at, a, at a level of strength that we didn't see under Hu Jintao, probably didn't, maybe didn't see under Zhang Zemin. And so he, he, he can theoretically work through these problems and maybe, you know, the corruption crackdown, may, maybe this is all about setting the stage to break through, to allow reforms to flourish. Not political, not sort of liberalizing political reforms, but the reforms they need to kickstart the economy. Um, I, my personal view is that, that they, he actually encountered a lot more bureaucratic resistance than he expected. Um, and that now you're gonna see um, sort of this, this came out in October, like going too far in the weeds, but the new, the updated discipline regulations from the CCDI had this Article 46 about sort of going against the will of the party center. And I've got, got framed a lot of places, it's all about an ideological crackdown. And, and, but, but in many ways, I think it's also about this is the lever they can use to go after officials who aren't actually pushing forward the reform policies. And so remember? I would expect over the next few months to year, you're going to see, in some ways, she declaring war on the bureaucracy. There was, was a moment last fall where Sorry? the, there was a moment last fall where the anti-corruption investigators went into the pricing department at the NDRC. Mm. If you remember this, and they essentially took down, they basically decapitated the pricing department. Yeah. They took down half the leadership of the department, and then something like three weeks later, they announced a big reform on the price catalog where they cut in half the number of prices that were in the price catalog. So, a coincidence? Mm. Maybe. They made the NRDC but, an offer they couldn't refuse. There you go. <laughs> um, I do think the, the party has, uh, has always been good at, um, at eliminating potential rivals to its power, and she uh, has done that. Uh, Personally, I think he's eliminated potential rivals to himself. Um, he's eliminated potential rivals within the party, um, and he's he's doing a very good job of exterminating potential rivals outside of the party. So, when you say, "Is there a chance of an elite split?" Um, I think you're talking about, "Is there a chance of a mutiny against Xi because he's the guy?" Uh, and I would be more in Bill's camp that you're not going to see that anytime soon. Jeremy, Evan, you guys want to have a last word? Just quickly on one belt, one road. I think it's very simple. Number one, it's a way of dealing with China's economic problems um, uh, that if it works will mean that uh, you know, overcapacity can be exported to places where it won't, you know, it'll be useful. Um, it's a way of, uh, of trying to, tr to transform the Chinese economy. Number two, it's a, an effort at soft power, at uh, uh, building links with uh, countries around the globe uh, where China is an important player and an important actor. Um, and number three, it's a really typically bad Communist Party name. They should have just called it <laughs> New Silk Road. <laughs> and it would have been much clearer what it is. Evan? I, I'm not going to try to top that. All right. Well, this, I got to say, this is, for me, this has been a lot of fun because it's like a reunion for me. We used to do this over beer in Beijing, and now we're doing it in Washington. So please, everyone, join me in thanking this terrific <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>